Hello, everybody. Welcome to week three. I love this week because this week we get to go over labor. You guys noticed how in week one we started off, you guys look for your demographic, you told us your location. Then uh, you found out your strengths and your weaknesses. Then in week two, you found out all the laws and regulations and your labor laws and regulations. And now in week three, we get to concentrate on labor because we want you to have a day off. We want you to have two days off in a row because that's important. I like how some people are shaking their heads like, no, <laughs> yes, you do not want to get burnt out. I know that, you know, your business, that's your baby, but sometimes, you know, mom and dad need to take a break and go see a movie and go have a life, get that work-life balance. And I know how hard this is because I am very much like you guys. I am horrible at work-life balance. But I know it now, <laughs> and if that's something that I work on constantly because it's important. It's important to give yourself a break, to be refreshed, because if you're refreshed, your staff will be refreshed, everybody will be in a good mood, your customer service will be good, the consistency of the product will be good because you're not overtired, and you're not just being like, oh, dear Lord, not another one of these chicken dishes. I have to do another one. You're not just trying to throw it out. You have that break. You were refreshed. Am I right, Chef Jonathan? Yes, please. I'm going to talk all about that. I know. I know where you worked. I know where Chef Jonathan worked. He was, he was just as bad as I was. <laughs> Especially at the, the place in Fort Collins. I know exactly where he was. So, um... Before we begin, how is everybody feeling about week two? A lot of research. A lot of research. It's a lot of research running a business, right? And remember, even if you decide you're not going to open up your own establishment, doing this research is really, really helpful because you're going to have to renew your liquor license, especially if you decide to, like your boss says, hey, we're going to open up another store. Can you handle that? Now you can say, yes, I can handle that. I know exactly where to go to find that liquor license. I know exactly where to go to find the fire department information, all that good stuff. That's why it's so important to do your research. Uh, and then Mandy, is my connection weak? Is my connection weak, folks? Am I good? It's looking good on my end, Chef. Okay. So, um, no, I'm sorry, Crystal just said something about her video can't, kept cutting off, and I was telling her that uh, if her connection's weak, then the video will will cut off. The bandwidth is low, and her video will cut off. So uh, I'm okay. trying to help her out with that. Uh, I don't know if that might that might be it. That might not. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mandy. All right. But how were the assignments looking for this week, Chef? For week two. Overall, really good. I got to see some really great research on your specific state, typically. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these regulations are more state than uh, city, but the fire inspection in particular is tends to be city. So I really loved what I saw overall. I'm just going to share my screen here to highlight a couple of things. One of the common things that I saw was just that missing concept summary. I want to know where you are. I want to know what type of business you're going to have, which is why this right up at the top here is really important. Letting me know what kind of business we're talking about, where in the country you are, uh, what your hours of operation are going to be. These are really important pieces of your business that, I, that are really informative of how you approach this assignment. So there was that. Another common mistake I saw was missing this middle column. Um, this is where you cite your sources. Let me know where you're getting your information from. When you're talking to investors, when you're talking to business partners, when you're talking to anybody involved in getting your concept up and running, they want to see that you went to a reliable source to get the information on what you need to do to be 
um, successful and to be following all these different regulations for your area. So that center column was all about citing your sources. Um, one of the other areas was I saw some copied and pasted work as opposed to putting it into your own words. It's really important that you process the information you find in your research and translate that into your own words. Tell me what this food handler's card is. It, well, it's all about food safety. It's a course. It says that I know how to safely handle food and not get your, your guests sick or your employees sick. That food manager certification, basically the same thing, just way more detailed. Um, having that in your own words shows that you really understand what these different things are or how you go about getting them, uh, who in your concept needs them, understanding that there are two different aspects to a lot of these questions. For instance, how many hours in a day and week before overtime? A lot of places in the, in the United States actually have laws that say after eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours in a single day, you have to pay that employee overtime. Other places, they don't have anything about that. They just say, hey, 40 hours a week, if you're under that, great. If you're over that, pay them overtime. So making sure that you're processing each and every part of these assignments is really important because a lot of these assignments are going to have multiple part questions and you want to address each part of these questions. So those were some of the more common stumbling blocks that I saw in this assignment was maybe missing one piece of one of these bullet points or um, not citing your sources, not having that concept summary. If that was the case, we were talking about this before we started recording, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. Uh, you guys do have the opportunity to resubmit as long as you get your submissions in before the deadline. You have until this coming Tuesday to resubmit that week two assignment after you make your corrections, after you um, flush out a little more detail if that's what's needed, after you add that concept summary. The big key part to resubmitting an assignment is going to that week's assignment page and actually resubmitting it. I can't really adjust your grade until you've clicked on that submit button again. Just like you submitted the first time, you're gonna go through that same process and I'll be able to see I need to take another look. So that's resubmits in a nutshell. All right, how's everybody feel about that? Feel good? Yes, Don. What is your yes, question? Yes, ma'am. So uh, for Chef Jonathan, uh, thanks for the feedback in the in the direction. Are you able to hear me well? I I got a good. Okay, good. So a lot of cut and paste, uh, like for myself, that as an analyst, I mean, we'll write our stuff, you know, borrow, steal, beg, whatever, and create our own. But I cite sourced it at the bottom of the page too. I wonder if that's okay to do because I want to show you where I got it from, but I want to change it because sometimes verbatim is, is the only way to say it, you know, a uh, bottom line up front. However, I did write in there, um, I think last week I said I did serve safe. I said it backwards last week. Uh, there's another company called Learn to Serve, which will help others um, in reference to looking some of that information up. To the, Related to the assignment, uh, some of the research on base is a little bit different. So I have state, federal, and then I have base requirements because it's on a, a military installation. So you have another whole set of rules that you got to follow. So I did not put that in there because I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. And I, I just didn't want to do that. I'm like, absolutely not. That's just too much. Um, so I just want to know if it's okay just to keep with, you know, for class environment purpose, just the open source that we find as obviously as open source. So here's my answer. And you may or may not like it. Yeah. You can have quotes. Sure but I wanna see you actually answer that question in your own words and you can use a quote to support the answer that you- Right, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and you did touch on another thing. ServeSafe is not the only place where you can get a food handler's card or a food manager's certification. There are other companies out there. Some places actually require you to go through their specific health department. Perfect. Oklahoma in particular comes to mind, I think, not 100% sure at the moment, but there are places that require you to go through the health department to get their specific uh, food handler's card and their specific 
food manager certification. So um, as far as those base requirements go, um, you definitely hit the requirements of the assignment. Um, looking at several levels of regulation like you did, um, knowing that you're going to need that when you go to actually open your business is definitely important information. Um, these assignments are a starting point and there's definitely going to be some more detail to flush out beyond this course when you approach actually opening your concept. So definitely it's, it's a good show. Uh, definitely. definitely. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Cause you can include that type of information in your business plan in your pitch to your investors. Those are the type of things that you can put that added information in. Um, because remember, this is that the baseline, the foundation, and then you build from here. Um, for example, we are going to build on your labor because right now there's only one of you, am I right? There's only one person at this place. It's in your head, you're working out the recipes, you're working, uh, but it's just you right now. And we need to figure out how many do you really need to be able to successfully run your operation and keep the quality consistent every single time. Now, here's a little thing for you guys to remember that your week two assignment is due tonight for those who have not turned it in yet. You can still turn it in late, but you got to do it tonight. We have our week three assignments going to be due on Tuesday and as always our live session. And as you guys already said, you got to do the research. Put this one in there again, because I love it. So do the research, look at your labor and state laws. You guys have already done that, which is fantastic. You have looked up what your laws and regulations were for last week and you found them and now you know how much overtime are you gonna do? How much money are your tipped employees going to get versus your hourly employees versus your salary? And one clear thing I also want to mention, when you guys are in fact going through figuring out how much to pay people, when you are looking at your salary employees, if you say, I'm going to pay you a thousand dollars a week, you and you have them working 50 hours, 60 hours a week, you cannot base that salary off of a 40 hour week because they're not working 40 hours. You have them consistently working 60 hours. So that's where it's really important to make certain that you are actually properly paying your employees, even your salary ones, at least minimum wage. Uh, who had a question? I saw somebody's hand go up. Uh, Crystal, what was your question? Okay, so if you have someone on salary, their salary that you have them on has to match the, or at least come close or something to the hours that they actually work? Yes. I mean, you want, if you have somebody go over, like, you know, you have them at based at 40 hours a week, but then they, for some week, you had a boatload of catering, so you have them working 50 hours. That's okay. You can do that. But if you are having them consistently work 50 hours, 60 hours, like that 60 hours every single week, then you need to make certain you're paying them for 60 hours worth of work, not 40 hours worth of work. And okay. that's where the salary, you're always going to have that little bit like, oh yeah, somebody worked 45 hours this week, but then they worked 35 hours the week before. And you're going to have a little bit of that back and forth, which is fine. But if you're consistently telling them you are working every single day, you're working from 9 a.m. till 9 p.m., um, that's, you have to pay them accordingly for that. Yes, Don. Yeah, you know, you touch up on something that I was thinking of in reference to 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. I mean, working 15, 16, 18 hours, but there's some gratuities or some meal plans in there that could be uh, in there as well, which is also a cost, which will bring that those hours of pay down. So you're providing them meals. Um, 
Well, yes and no, actually. Right. It's, it's touchy. It's very, it's very touchy. It's a contractual obligation of saying, yeah, I'm giving you 40 hours, but now you're doing 50. Now you've increased, but I'm also giving you meals that cut back. It's kind of, uh, they used to do it back in the eighties and I, I don't, I haven't been there since. Yeah, no, they don't really let you, they don't say like, well, I'm going to pay, I'm going to give you food. So that's gonna, you're not going to get paid for that hour. People won't quite go for that. That's an added perk, an added benefit that you can provide to your employees. Um, it is not required, but that's part of that benefit package. A benefit package doesn't just have to be health insurance. You can include the vacation time because vacation time is actually not a requirement. Um, but you can have vacation as a perk. You can have comp like a one comp meal or like one free beer after you, your shift is done. That is a comp. Um, that's an added benefit, but you cannot tell that person like, well, I gave you food. So therefore you're not getting paid for it. Right. It was, it's, it's a, right. Like you were saying though, and then comp hours was the other part I was thinking of, you know, cause I've done a lot of establishments where you work so many hours and they would work overtime. You would get comp hours. So you'd get, those same hours, but you may be off, but you're still going to get paid for it. Um, that was just between me and that establishment. Okay. Yeah. And that's where you guys kind of have to decide what you want to do for your establishment. Um, and for your area, Mary Lou, what is your question? My question is kind of like what uh, Don just asked in regards to the meals. Is there a limited of meals that you should, uh, I get it. It would be a perk. It's an additional perk by you working there. Is it like, a, okay, just one meal a day or one meal a shift? How does that work? Or is there a percentage that they're paid? Because I know an establishment I worked on, it was a coffee house. And I mean, she allowed us to drink as much coffee, smoothies, whatever we wanted, as much as we wanted. So it's like, that is a six, anywhere between a five to a $10 drink. And if we're having each employee take three of those a day and it made no sense to me, to me, I'm like, you're losing money, but that's the way she says she would make up for it. I don't understand how. And that's where knowing uh, those kind of things and knowing your numbers um, is going to be very, very important because you don't have to, like, it's a perk. You don't have to provide it. Some places provide a pre-meal shift where they, everybody gets together, they eat, they talk about the food. This is going to be the special. This is the wine that will go with the food to give that wait staff a better feel for how to sell it to the employee, like to the customer. Other places, it's just, I'm going to get like, and you know, I can have up to $10 worth of food or drink and then that's it. I've worked at places where they said you can have one thing and then as much like soda drinks as like fountain drinks as you wanted. Uh, I've worked at places where they say, here's like, you get one drink, you don't get any food from us, but you'll get one like beer and that's it. How about you, chef? Uh, for me, I always looked at the cost the act, my cost of the item as opposed to the menu price. So for instance, with coffee, I might mm -hmm. be charging five bucks for a fancy coffee drink, mm -hmm. but it might only cost me 50 cents. Mm -hmm. um, so I look at that when I'm looking at what employees have access to and what they don't. But I also have always firmly believed that a hungry cook is not a good cook. Mm -hmm. So I like offering shift meals. I like my employees being able to eat. And in some places that I've been, it's been a big family meal where they, where one person on the staff cooks a meal for everybody and it's some big casserole or hotel pan kind of dish. Mm -hmm. um, I love to, I, I do love providing that. And like in a, in a coffee shop, it makes sense to provide the coffee because um, People need caffeine to survive. <laughs> yes. Um, it also allows you as an employee in that coffee place to understand the product you're selling as well. And you can talk to guests and be like, hey, I really like when I do this weird drink that's not quite um, as popular, but this is what I love to do. And it, your passion ignites that in the guests. And um, so it can be a really powerful tool. 
Okay. Yeah. Now, Matthew, what was your question? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I really don't have a question. I just wanted to kind of make a statement because my mom was a regional manager for the Department of Labor, and she now is is an HR manager for every government contract. And from what I understand under the fair and labor laws, when someone's under salary, that you generally work them what their 40 hour work week is, but if they do go over, there's no real federal law that says that you have to adjust pay for them working over. Is that correct or is my wrong? That goes off a of state. Or is it state by state. Then? That's state by state, then. Okay, no. Because, like, for example, in, Colorado, in my state, you would have to pay overtime. Uh -huh. Like, for your salary as employees in Colorado, you're going to pay overtime. So, okay, that's so where. Like in a state like mine, I live in Alabama, their state law goes by federal law only. There's no labor laws written in Alabama. So, and, I would just then adhere to the federal law, right? Yep. And that's why we had you guys look up that information in week two so that you can do your assignment in week three knowing what your actual overtime laws are for your area. Um, and it's not just about what's going to be lawful. Remember, how are you, we talked about ethics last week and creating core values and creating a culture and you know, this is going to be your culture's organization. Now, how happy do you think your employees are going to be with the amount of pay versus hours you're going to make them work? So I know some people, this is where I always say, nobody's going to love your business as much as you do. That's just, this is your baby. It's been with you forever and nobody's going to love it as much as you do. So that's where knowing you know, you can't just expect people to work a billion hours and say, well, I'm paying them. You have my, you might have people like me who have a small child who doesn't want to work seven, six days, seven days a week. I want to see my kid grow up. I'm not going to, even if you pay me a million dollars, I will probably not take it. Well, I'll probably do it for like a month if you paid me a million and then I'd be good. <laughs> and then, but it's not, that's going to create a high turnover rate and you don't want to have a high turnover rate in your establishment. And that's where knowing how many people you're actually going to need to make your, your concept work is going to be very important. You have to, cause a lot of times people don't realize how many people they actually need uh, for those People who are doing food trucks. How many people are doing food trucks? Or catering? My favorite example are food mm -hmm. trucks and catering. Uh, yeah, because in catering and in food truck, you have to prep the food. You have to go drive to that commissary kitchen, especially for a food truck, because you can't uh, cook it all on the, on the truck. Health re department requires that you go to that commissary kitchen and you prep your food. So you have to have time to prep. You have to have time to uh drive to the location that you want to go to you have to have time to clean that commissary kitchen before you even leave then you actually have to cook on the food truck and do like your business those hours of operation you have then you have to drive back to the commissary kitchen you have to unload you have to clean that out same thing with catering, same thing with restaurants. If you're going to be closed at 10 p.m., you cannot have everybody leaving at 10 p.m. What if somebody shows up at 9.50 and food? Your hours say you're open. You have to feed them. So you need to make certain you have that time in between to let those people clean, let everybody uh, do the closing checklist and, or your opening checklist and prepping and all of that wonderful information. Am I right, Chef Jonathan? You are, and I do have a question for you. We have a lot of students who want to do a bakery. Ooh. Do bakers need to get in before opening to the public? <laughs> yes, when I was a baker, in fact, I would have to go in at, my hours were at, uh, the place opened at 
7 a yeah it was 7 a.m the place opened and i would have to be there at 3 a.m to cook all the bread because they baked all of their bread so i would be in charge of baking i would be in charge of actually prepping like i would have to do like the they did a green chili so i would make the green chili in the morning i would get the bacon ready i would get the potatoes ready while i was getting all my breads and everything and pastries and done and everything done so yes you have to be there quite early if you're going to do a bakery because everybody expects fresh stuff especially with a bakery they all want fresh 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 stuff i work at a bakery right now it's a small uh, country bakery but i have to be there at 4 a.m we open at 6 a.m and it's uh it's cinnamon rolls and uh halachis and uh it's so it's so hysterical because some mornings I have to be there at four. Some some mornings I have to be there at eight. The morning yeah. at and four well, is well, completely different. Yeah, well, and I mean, there's even overnight bakers because I used to be a bread baker too. I'd be making my like with a real starter, you know, have to feed that sucker. <laughs> like worse than a baby sometimes and you have to uh work a full shift from like i would worked 11 a.m to 7 a.m uh and the place opened at 7 a.m and so and that was br baking bread i baked bread all night so those are things you have to consider when you are doing a bakery now to get a good idea i want to give you guys some of the Different names. Do you guys remember this delightful brigade system right here for back of the house? If you're going to be fancy, do you remember who created this awesome system? It's Gauthier. Yes, thank you. It's Gauthier. He made this delightful system for you guys. So when you're looking at who's going to do what, you have your chef de cuisine or executive chef, your sous chef, saucier. I mean, who wouldn't want it like? the fritiere that sounds, sounds so much better than a fry cook right when you're doing your resume put fritiere that sounds way better <laughs> and then uh, i also wanted to give you guys some of the front of the house remember all these slides are going to be on the main page for you guys um and if you didn't like the names of these i gave you guys a link to all the different names of every type of position for you know and you can click on it and it'll take you to a little explanation of what they do so i wanted to have that for you guys especially for your assignment this week and as i said before these are going to be here and then real quick remember as you're doing your assignment this week you need to think about how many your hours of operation how much prep time how much cleaning are you going to need what type of food are you doing are you going to be a michelin rated like michelin star rated establishment where it's high dining high end where you're going to need table side service and more wait staff or are you going to be food truck super fast don't need to worry about making like a chef's like a caesar salad table side or any of that kind of stuff that's where your concept is going to be extremely important because we can and chef jonathan will be able to look to make certain you actually have enough people for your place um if you're open 24 7 then yeah you're going to be open 24 7 which means you're going to need a manager well, all day long because that's a big key for you guys to also remember you need to have a manager there why do you think having a manager there is going to be so important in case something goes wrong yes in case something goes wrong because stuff happens and it's okay that stuff happens but oh i think i missed that slide Haha, uh -huh. because you want to be proactive instead of reactive, especially when it comes to labor. You really want to make certain that you do look ahead and see what your needs are. This is where looking at your numbers, understanding what your competition is doing, because you guys looked at your competition week one, right? You're seeing what their hours are looking like. How busy are they? Because then you 
can use that information to help forecast what you may need for your establishment. And when I say forecast, I mean looking ahead, which you guys, you guys are used to forecast all the time, right? The weather channel, weather channel happens, there's a forecast. Those weathermen, weather ladies are looking to see, figure out what that weather is going to be for the following days, for that week. The good old farmer and almers, ugh, farmer's almanac goes all year. They're trying to help figure out and determine how much labor you're going to need. And you can, that's why it was important for you guys to do the research in your area because you know your location best, right? <laughs> you know if you're going to be in a mountain town where you have um it's a mountain town and it's a ski town and it's going to be busier during the winter time than it is during the summertime you're going to want to be proactive about this because you want your Qual like the consistency in your product. You want it to be consistent every single time. And having your labor and understanding how much you need is going to help you go into and uh, measure your consistency, making certain that you have positive moments of truth for your customer. And when I say positive moments of truth, I mean, this is the first time that they walked in, they get to see the place, how is it going to look for them? Are they gonna be happy with what they see or are they gonna be like, oh, it's all right, you know? But you wanna have enough labor, you wanna have that hostess there saying, why yes, it's a pleasure to have you here or have that cashier at your food truck because you know, you can't just be the only one in the food truck because you can't handle money and food at the same time. Those kind of items, you want those positive moments of truth for your customer. And you can do that by examining your concept, looking at your area, figuring out how busy you think you're gonna be. And you just, you already started looking at your competition, you know how busy they are. You can get a sense to how busy you're gonna be. And then deciding how much, uh, how the level of service you want to provide. You guys already know that you're going to do table side versus counter service, all that information. Now you get to decide how much wait staff will you actually need? How much, uh, how many dishwashers do you think you will need to be there cleaning up or busters, all of that great stuff. Now I wanted, we for this assignment, we are actually, uh, and Chef Jonathan's gonna take over the assignment here in a sec. We want to give you extra time to go over the assignment because you will be creating your own schedule for your business. I did want to show you that there are programs and softwares out there that you can use that will help you create your, uh, your schedule. We're doing it now on Excel for you because Excel is always a great base to go off of and you know, it's free, um, especially for the Google Docs, but there are these places that you can use and they will help create your schedule. They'll help tell you if you had enough people on, if it was busy, the, you know, when people clocked in, when they clocked out, they give you all of that. They take all that information and they'll give it to you in a report, uh, which can be very, very helpful for you. So I wanted to show you these two right here that you guys uh, could look at for later on when you are ready to actually start doing the schedule because these softwares can be very, very useful. Um, but we're going to go over your assignment and the awesomeness of Excel. Am I right, Chef Jonathan? If I can hit the mute button. Yeah. You are right. I love Excel. I really do. It makes me happy. <laughs> uh, Don, did you have a question? Before we yes. Here? Uh, in reference to the overnight manager and overnight employees, um, pay changes overnight. Differential pay, time and a half. Um, is that something we're going to be looking at as well? Or is that just we're just going to leave it as just you're just doing the 40 hours? 
time frame? Because I know probably each state is different in considering uh, pay when you took an overnight pay. Not holiday pay, just when you're working overnight. Well, and you know, it is actually dependent on every place. Now I know, um, and there's a d d d difference between exempt employees versus non-exempt employees, because hospitals, obviously, they're going to pay people more, like, for working that night shift, but as a baker, I did not make one dime more, because that, that was the shift, that's when it was, that's how much a baker made, and so... Uh, and it is dependent on your area and your um, and the type of business because, and I say the type of business because a hospital has a restaurant. They have that cafeteria there versus like a mom and pop shop. Am I right, Jeff? <laughs> you are coming from those types of environment. I've been in both. Um, Oh, that's right. You have. Oh, you're perfect for that. <laughs> I have worked overnight shifts I, many, many times um, where I've crossed over that midnight point. And like Chef Rachel was saying, it is very dependent on where you are. But most places are looking at overtime pay on a 24 on a 40 hour work week within a seven day period. So as long as it's seven days from the beginning of your work week till seven days later from that minute or that day, and there's only 40 hours in between, you usually don't have any overtime, even if it's an overnight shift in most places, not all. Some places also look at consecutive hours within a 24 hour period. So most places don't account for the date change at midnight. The really tricky question is daylight savings time. Ooh, I was just gonna bring that up, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a yeah. lot of um, scheduling software has trouble with daylight savings time. And I have had to go in and manually change everybody's hours to reflect that change in time because there are that, there's that overnight shift. So overnight shifts have their very own personalities and challenges and advantages. And if you're built for it, it's great. And if you're not built for it, it's terrible. And yeah, so I've got a lot of experience there if you want to talk a little more in depth about those overnight shifts as well. Um, but I am going to shift gears now and talk about your assignment. Um, as he's go. pulling that up, remember, uh, really look at this schedule and chef can you go to the day out, uh, daily hours, one of those cells there, like say Monday. Well, Yep. Do you see all of the coding oh. that is right up there? All of that beautiful coding. You can thank Chef Jonathan for doing that for you right now. You need to give him a lot of props for that because he just thank saved you. time. <laughs> so you need to give him props for really putting that much coding in. And why is that coding there, Chef? <laughs> so uh, I was going to get there, so I'm glad you brought it up. What this coding does is it will add up your hours for the day, accounting for the difference between a 12-hour clock and a 24-hour day. It also will automatically take a 30-minute lunch break out of, that, out of your shift if it's six hours or longer. So you don't have, this will automatically account for those 30-minute off-the-clock lunch breaks that you have to be offering your employees. This will account for going from a.m. to p.m. Uh, it adds it all up for you. And this is really important to keep in mind because this is incredibly important information that gets added up here in the weekly hours cell. This cell will populate as you work through your schedule for each and every employee telling you, hey, I'm getting near that 40-hour mark. I better not schedule them another eight hour shift. So a huge piece of this assignment is avoiding overtime. That's worth a lot of points on this assignment. Nobody can be in overtime. So please do keep that in mind. Um, another thing is make sure you're only entering information where you're supposed to. If it's not a white cell, 
don't try to type there um, because you're going to mess up the spreadsheet and then you won't have all of these shortcuts provided for you. Can That's you just block those cells? You can lock the pink cells, can't you? I, there are ways around that that every block students seem to find. Uh, <laughs> but I do appreciate the recommendation. Uh, so just fair warning, guys, these are the, here to help you and to make this easier for you. Um, if you do happen to overwrite one of these cells, you will get a warning box that says, hey, I don't think you meant to do that. If you accidentally do find a way to delete the information in that cell, I'm trying to think how to do that. There we go. If you happen to mess that up, make sure you press Control Z to undo it. And there it is, that formula is right back there. Um, so a large part of this assignment is understanding how this worksheet works. So the first thing you, I want you guys to do is put your concept summary here. I need all of that wonderful information you put in there in week one. And then you added that to your week two assignment. Now it's incredibly relevant here as well, because if I don't know your hours of operation, I have no idea if you've staffed appropriately. If I don't know if you're a catering company, a food truck, a bakery, a restaurant, I have no idea if you've staffed your, your concept appropriately. It's another whole bunch of points. So this concept summary is incredibly important. If I don't know where in the country you are, I don't know if you've hit the labor law requirements or not. I, you can't get the grade you want if you don't have that concept summary. And I, I really don't know, even know how to put it differently than that because I just don't understand what you've put in front of me if I don't have that concept summary. So first step, concept summary. Um, you know, all that wonderful information. Next up, think about who's gonna be in your, your business. First cell, the first person I want to see here is you. So you're gonna be the owner, right? but you're gonna have more responsibilities than that. So think about what it is that you're gonna be doing in this business. Are you gonna be more of a general manager overseeing everybody else and a little bit of, you're kind of involved in everything? Well, you can do owner slash GM. Are you gonna be really focused on the kitchen and really executing the culinary side? Just type in executive chef. Make sure you're addressing what role you are going to have in this business beyond just owner. But remember also that executive chef, owner, those titles typically means you're spending less time in the kitchen and more time in front of the computer, looking at your numbers, looking at the finances, making certain the tr like all the recipes, the quality, um, all of like your marketing, your networking, all of that stuff is included because you are the owner. You have to be out there. You have to make certain that the product is right. You do not have time to be on the kitchen, on the line every single day. Am I right, Chef? Absolutely. Thank you. So, Mandy, I do see your hand is up. I'm going to power through how to work this worksheet real quick and then I'm gonna do some questions. So once you have your staff in place, then you're gonna come through and select your shift. So this top cell is gonna be what time that person gets in. So let's say I'm coming in at midnight, 12 a.m. Bummer for me, right? Now I need to think about what time I'm gonna be there until, what time am I out? This second cell right beneath it, this is the time that you're leaving. So I'm working 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. You'll see that I now have a number here. This is a seven and a half hour shift because it assumes that I'm gonna take a half an hour and eat something at some point during that eight hour shift. Now, if I'm gonna have that same schedule every day of the week, I can highlight those two 
press control C or copy. Come over here, press control V or paste, 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 paste. Quick and easy, you only have to do it once if you've got a set schedule throughout the week. If you're gonna have varying hours, you just go in and adjust those where you need to. But that would be the way I would recommend doing a lot of your cooks, servers, people who are gonna have more set hours day to day. A lot of your managers are gonna have less set hours where they're really adjusting to the rest of the staff. So just something to think about. You will see that as I added in those shifts, my weekly hours got added as well. So all of these added up equals 37 and a half hours. At, I am gonna be a salaried manager. The owner, pretty much gonna be a salaried manager. Why do I want your pay in here? Can anybody tell me? We're getting to the budget. Yes. Oh, that was so perfect, I can't even tell you. Um, you need to pay your mortgage. You need to pay your lease. You need to pay for groceries at home. You need to take care of yourself in order to be successful in your business. So you want to work your own salary into your business plan and account for it in your labor costs. Super important. So, And for everybody. those who think that, oh, well, I'm not going to pay myself, for this assignment, you're paying yourself. It is a requirement. Yes. Yes. So because I am going to be salaried, I'm going to ignore the hourly rate here. doesn't apply to me. I'm going to put in a weekly salary rate. So let's say I want to pay myself, I don't know, uh, $52,000. $52, <laughs> yes, perfect. $52,000 a year. In order to find my weekly um, salary, you're going to use this red box. Take your annual salary, $52,000, divide it by 52, and that'll give you your weekly salary of $1,000. Everyone is either going to have an hourly pay or a salary pay, but not both. If you try to do both, if you decide somebody should be salaried and then you change your mind and you put in, oh, well, I want them to get $12 an hour, you're going to get this error message. I did type these error messages. Please be nice. Um, <clears throat> so before I can change that, I need to delete the salary and then come over here and add the hourly or vice versa, whatever the case may be. So you're gonna do that for your concept for every single employee you're gonna need. So let's say I'm gonna have a pub. I've got my concept summary right at the top here. I've got myself, owner, executive chef, I'm making $1,154 uh, $1, every week. I have a front of house manager who's also on salary. By the way, I want to see at least three employees for every salaried manager you have. Please do not have everyone on salary. Most places do not allow this legally. You have to spend most of a majority of your time in a supervisory role or an administrative role. That's why I'm looking for at least three hourlies for every salary. Um, so I've got this 250 seat restaurant. I need a lot of staff. So I've got me, I've got a front of house manager. I've got two sous chefs, saute, pantry, grill, fry, busser. You'll notice those are not the traditional brigade names for these positions. That's okay. Totally fine with that. Not a problem. I've got bussers, bartenders, bar backs, servers. The list goes on. Um, you do not have to have this many people in your concept. Think about your concept and how many people you're really going to need. If you are a catering company, if you are a personal chef, uh, if you are any of those types of concepts where typically you're not going to have a, pr a really set schedule, think about a really busy week. Catering company. With this schedule, I've got events on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evenings. 
And that's what I would like to see is a busy week or busy weekend for your company, whatever it is. You'll see that I have time to receive inventory. I, the owner, am coming in on the day that nobody else is there just to get the product ready to go so that on Wednesday, we can start to prep. Thursday, we're prepping. Friday, we're prepping. And I've got my servers and cooks and chefs, people there to execute this um, party. I also note that bartender has supervisory duties. This is important. I need to see that you have a manager or supervisor on at all times that anyone else is in your concept. If there's a dishwasher there, they cannot be there alone. A cook, a busser, a server have to always have some type of su supervisor there. Why do you think that is? In case something happens. <laughs> In case something happens. A lot of theft can happen when managers aren't around. Bottles of wine disappear. Bottles of liquor. All that fun stuff. Got to be careful with that. Random people wander in the back door of the kitchen when everybody's busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody's got to be in charge <laughs> to call the cops and go, uh, could you please come get this drunk out of our walk-in? Yeah, somebody's got to be responsible. And I, the owner, want to have somebody to point to when something goes wrong and say, hey, why'd you let this happen? Somebody has to take responsibility for that shift and they need to be compensated for that responsibility. If you have a lead server, they should make more money than the servers. If you have a lead cook, they should make more money than the cooks. Um, if you're a personal chef concept, you're gonna have clients who want you to throw parties for their friends. You're gonna have 50, 100 people parties that you're throwing. I want you to schedule like it's one of those weeks. So you're going to have your regular hours, plus you're going to need help to execute that party. You're going to need servers. You're going to need some type of kitchen help, plus yourself, for that event. So please make sure that there's several people on these. Imagine it's the, one of those really busy weeks. And also think, if you're like, well, I'm just going to have a bunch of volunteers, remember, you cannot rely on volunteers alone. And... Uh, what happens if no one can help you and no one volunteers to help you that week? You have to pay people. So how much would you actually pay those people who would not volunteer for you? Also. One more type of concept I just want to hit on real quick because I know a lot of people are doing a food truck. Um, food trucks, you're going to need at least two people cooking and one person to actually take money and interact with your guests. These are separate jobs, separate stations, things that you're gonna need. Um, so you're definitely going to need to have at least two people on the truck at all times, a cook and a cashier. Probably gonna need more than that, just depending on your concept. Remember, the last thing I wanted to mention here is time before opening. I wanna see at least an hour before your service time, people starting to come in. At least an hour after closing, I want to see people scheduled out. may not take you an hour to actually close down your concept, but if you're scheduled that way and something doesn't go right in closing, you have time. Those people aren't going into overtime just because they had to stay a little bit late. Was, there, have... any, oh, was there any issues with AM versus PM? People putting like 9 to 3 but not putting 9 AM to 3 PM. So with this, you are going to choose AM or PM. And double check that because you don't, if you make a mistake, magically somebody can end up working 20 hours in one day that you may not have expected. So double check those AM versus PMs. Cool. Did I miss anything, Chef? I don't think so. I think you were good. Just remember to have enough people. and. Everybody doesn't have to be full-time. You can have part-time employees. You can have a dishwasher who just comes in part-time to give the other dishwashers a day off. That is okay. Um, so remember that it doesn't all have to be full-time.
You can have two part-time people, which equals one full-time person. <laughs> um, Marge, yes, please do list each cook individually. And... Yeah, because that's going to screw up your budget. If you do cook one and two, that means that it, it screws up your total budget because you only accounted for one cook's pay, not two cook's pay. This will also fill out as you get all your information in. All the way up to the top here, you'll have annual hourly, weekly hourly, salary, and then your total annual payroll. And can you scroll all the way down so they can see the total at the very bottom too? Sure. You see all that great work that Chef Jonathan did for you? You guys see that? You should give him props. <laughs> see how I'm like citing where that information came from <laughs> by giving Chef Jonathan props there? <laughs> all right. So Mandy, what was your question? Okay. First of all, giving uh, Chef Jonathan props, that's, that's a fantastic spreadsheet and that I'm, I'm a little jealous. I, oh, my concept, second of all, my concept, it, it's, it's not a personal chef concept, but it is a, uh, having my own commercial kitchen and my own food truck. I want to pay, as far as my budget is concerned, I, I, I need a front of house person, someone who handles, um, it, to me, the food truck is going to be front of house because that's what's going to be out in the public. And I want a back of house person. That's who's going to manage my commercial kitchen. Ideally, I'm going to be able to, because I already have the space, I just have to fill it out. I want to be able to rent that out to other people. Um, are you, are you I, what is your suggestion as far as, I'm not completely ignorant as far as the business aspect of it is concerned, but the, the, the cooking is more fun. <laughs> um, the, the, you know, the, the creative aspect is more fun. Uh, do I, do I try to do both myself? Do I try to be front of house and back of house manager? Do I try to do all of that myself and, and delegate smaller roles in both aspects? Or do I need, do I need to find a, uh, do I need to find a Sundance to my butch? I'm so I'm, I'm going to use a analogy for you guys that you are flying a plane. You are the pilot. You're flying a plane. You're 30,000 feet up in the air. When you're 30,000 feet up in the air, you can see everything, right? You can see the whole picture of what your business is doing. But if you're down in the trees, in the woods, in the thick of it, cooking all the time, you can't see what's happening. If you're doing all those daily tasks that an hourly employee could be doing for you, you won't be able to see the horizon. You can't see all the entire picture. So I need you as a manager, as an owner to fly that plane, fly it at 30,000 feet, make it so you see everything because this is where a lot of people get into trouble because they're so used to doing that hourly, uh, that hourly job that when it is their turn to become a manager, become an owner, they're so used to doing the hourly that they don't do what the owner and managers need to do. You're not doing your HR. Like you're not handling conflict resolutions or doing your marketing or looking at your numbers. You're putting that off because you're too busy cooking. So I, because the reason I'm, I'm doing this at the ripe old age of 45 it is because I, I, love, I love cooking and I love being with, you know, feeding people. So I need, I need to find a butch to my Sundance. I need to find someone who can plan the expeditions and, and see the big picture and let me concentrate on the more creative side, what I, what I want to do. So it's kind of like, a, you know, uh, what is it, Cake Boss? The cake boss yeah. guy, you know him? You know yes. how he has his siblings are there and the siblings actually run all of the business and right. he's just in the background cooking? 
He just makes the awesome cakes. Yeah. yeah. He just makes the cakes, but the sisters are the ones who are taking the orders. That's another great thing for those who are doing caterings or baking and you're going to be doing wedding cakes. You need a person there to be handling your guest, that special event person who can actually take the cake to the uh, events or be able to handle all of the, you know, like the wedding planner, the actual planner who's going to help create the contracts, do all that stuff. A lot of times people forget about that aspect because we're dealing with this weekend, the bakery that I work in, we're doing a wedding cake and it just came up today that we don't have, we don't have the transportation of the wedding cake um, finalized, like who's coming to get it, how it's going to be transported, who's transported, is it their responsibility or our responsibility? It's this afternoon was, uh, it, it was a flipping nightmare and I was just washing dishes. I just had my back to the whole conversation and I'm still stressed out because, well, and that's where it's important work that stuff out before. Yeah, and that's why it's important to see what people are doing and know what you like and what you didn't like so you can implement it into your business. Um, let's get some other questions going. Mary Lou, what was your question? I actually have two questions, and I wrote them right down so I wouldn't forget. Um, for the lunch hour, normally that is given only for an eight-hour work schedule, correct? So oh, that's tricksy. Uh, typically, because I didn't see anything that on the laws when we went back for the labor laws, I didn't see anything specifically when it came to lunch breaks. Usually, so that's why I'm all like, Ooh, how does that work? It's typically uh, eight hours or the greater part of eight hours. It's tricky. So basically, anything over six hours, you need to give a thirty-minute lunch break. That's why it's built that way. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. under six hours, you can typically just do two 15 minute on the clock breaks, 10 minute on the clock breaks, whatever your local rules are on breaks. Okay, because I, I was trying to think back when I did work in a restaurant. And I remember when the business was slow, it was there was too many of us, but they couldn't send us home because they needed us to shut down. We would get 15 minute breaks, 20 minute breaks, but we had to physically clock out considering we were only working six hours. So that was a tricky one. Okay, so got that one down. Now my second question, um, per se, my concept is more of a smaller uh, breakfast lunch type facility open only six days a week. Can you have one employee do two jobs? Like can you have, for example, your cashier do also some of your dishes considering that it will be very minimal dishes or that wouldn't work? You can cross train your staff, but go ahead, Chef Jonathan. I think we were about to say the same thing. Uh, you don't want your dish to be your dish pit to be uh -huh. in easy sight of your guests, right? Mm -hmm. So having your cashier, front of house guest facing person, getting dirty, washing dishes, and having them keep that register in sight and being able to see that front of house area, that might not be the best combination. Can you have cooks also washing their own dishes? Mm -hmm. Sure, I've, I've seen that quite a bit. I've, I've been that cook mm -hmm. who washes all the dishes as well. Um, so you really wanna be very careful about what tasks you're giving to which people. For okay. instance, the bartender does do dishes. Mm -hmm. They'll wash glasses while they're bartending. Yeah. Not a lot of mess, and it's hidden under that counter. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, you want to put some careful thought into that. Okay, no, you, you made a lot of sense right now with what you just said. I, it, it made perfect sense. Now I got it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Paul, what's your question? My question is based on my uh, scheme. How do I figure out how many uh, chefs I need in the back, how many dishwashers, and how many servers? So in 155, you made a plan of your kitchen, right? So you know how many stations you're going to have, right? Yeah. So that's probably how many cooks you're going to need at your peak hours. If you're 
thinking you're going to have some slower business and you designed your kitchen in a way that multiple stations can be covered by one person, then you can pull back on that a little bit, but make sure during your dinner hours, you've got enough cooks to cover all those stations. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. What about the front of the house? For front of house, I typically like anywhere from 15 to 20 seats per server at peak hours. That roughly turns out to be three to four tables per server. And depending on the type of service you're providing too, are you going to make them, is it going to be like Julia Child and, um, or not Julia Child, Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman where it's all that table service and it's nonstop and you have somebody there with white gloves pouring you champagne, you're going to need more people versus a faster paced one where maybe the wait staff can handle like four or five, have four or five tables themselves. Um, so that's where it's important to know that level you're going to provide to be able to understand how many uh, wait staff you'll need. I actually do have some great articles also for you guys that I will send out uh, tomorrow um, that will help with that go over the, those type of things. Like if you're going to have this level of service, this is how many wait staff you're going to need and that kind of thing. So I will send those out to you guys as well so that you have those. Uh, any other, what, uh, uh, Erica, what was your question? Thank you, Chef John. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul, were you done? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, just... Yeah, I, was, I was just giving <laughs> Tito the chef. Yes, you should. Everybody should, Everybody <laughs> should be. send him emails. Hey, hey, Chef. Sorry, I'm back and forth working and listening. Okay, so my question was, when I'm doing the numbers to pay my employees, am I like adding, subtracting, dividing? What am I doing? So when you're figuring out your pay for each employee, let's go back over here. An hourly rate is just that. You set how much you want to pay that person for every hour they work. So let's mm -hmm. say I'm going to do $12 an hour. This sheet does all the work for you. It says it tells you how much that equates to for the week. It automatically okay. fills in up here. There's no math to be done. Okay. For so, your and Sorry. you guys know what your uh, minimum wage is. So you can decide, are you going to give your employees more than minimum wage? Are you not? Because if I said, oh, I'm going to pay people here 10 bucks an hour. Well, that's not minimum wage. Minimum wage here is $11.10. So I have to up it up. Um, do I pay $11.10 for my cooks or am I going to pay them a little bit more because I, I don't want a high turnover rate? I want to give them a little extra. I'm going to pay them $13 an hour. You can't. This is where it's up to you to decide. So I just started working in a restaurant in my life um, last week. And the reason why I say that, because um, I'm paying, getting paid $10 an hour to be a, um, a, um, a, 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 I guess, what you call a, a line chef. So, but then the chefs are, some of the cook, like the, um, the chef that cooks in the back, he makes 14 or 15 every um, hour. And then the, um, Grill chef makes 13. So, I mean, is it like, am I supposed to be trying to change up people pay like that? Because I'm a little confused because in North Carolina where I'm at, the average is $7.25 for starting out. But I know when I looked online to different jobs, it was like different prices for different companies. So I'm confused. How do you give the the right amount but not overpay them but give them a, a good amount they can be able to survive on and they, they pay you pay them pay them well so they stay with you not quit so go ahead right. Jeff oh I pulled up if you do not know how much to pay you can pull up indeed.com I wrote Lion Cook for Boulder Colorado and you can get an idea of how much people are getting paid. That's what I told her, and she was just like, "Oh well." Um, so I didn't. That's why I was trying to figure out what was what was really going. Like, what's really going on with that situation? You can do the same thing right here. If I was going to work in Cambridge, Mass, I'm going to be making sixteen bucks an hour because that is in the city. Um, 
Concord Mass is really expensive. Am I right, Paul? Uh, so you can go on Indeed and you can um, you can look here. You can look and you can see what the averages are just by just go to Indeed, go to Craigslist. You can do that and then get a better idea of how much you how much people are making. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Chef. Just you did ask if there was any math involved in figuring out people's pay, and the only time there is is again with those salaried managers. You're going to figure out the annual pay, whatever you're going to pay them annually, $52,000 a year, and you're going to divide that by 52. You can actually have this do that for you by just entering equals, whatever your annual salary is, divided by 52. It'll do the math for you. Yeah, but if you got a, if you got a food truck and you have four people plus, I mean, well, Four, four people or five all together on that food truck. How would you are the one that's making the? You're not. They doing. They. You're the only one that's doing it out. I mean, not you. They doing hourly, but you're you're the only one that's not doing it hourly. The owner. Yes. Yes. So, Typically on a food truck, the owner is the only one who's gonna have a salaried pay. Also. So, go ahead. Sorry, just talking about salary managers, please don't burn out salaried people, including yourself. Anything over 60 hours in a week, I will take points off for. Just a heads up. And don't be mean. Don't like have somebody scheduled until like 1 a.m. and then have them work at like 6 a.m. That's just mean. <laughs> just, just to think about. I've worked those hours before and that's yes. rough. <laughs> in the Chat, what you guys are talking about is uh, tip credit. In a lot of places, you can pay $2.15 an hour to your uh, tipped employees. However, they need to end up making at least minimum wage once you account for those tips. So you can have like a $5, $5.35 tip credit applied to their wages. So just to address what I'm seeing coming up in the chat over here, a lot of places do have that tip credit, and that's kind of how that works. And then, uh, Crystal, what was your question, real quick? Um, question was kind of like um, the other question that um, I think his name was John asked about the employees and how many you need, and can they um, do two jobs like? And then um, also, I wanted to know about the cashier part, the person that's doing, um, taking the money. You have to have a person there all the time taking the money, right? Yep. For your food truck, yes. Yeah. So that means I have to hire two, at least two cashiers. Yep. <laughs> I can't work up 12 hours a day or nothing like that. So mm -hmm. then um, I have a janitor slash dishwasher. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's that's totally fine. And then the prep, a prep cook in the dishwasher. So, I, I just wanted to know also how many, um, how many people did you have to have per salary person again? Three. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, perfect. And then Melanie, what was your question? Mine wasn't necessarily a question. I'm sorry, I'm kind of hard of speaking right now. I just, I got my first. Uh, experience in the in first I got to work as a wait you're breaking up Melanie so can't hear you right now um can you hear me now yes okay okay my connection's a little messed up it's storming I got my first culinary um like experience at Pizza Hut I got to start working as a waitress there first and then I got moved up to management but I cross-trained you know, it's like a CSR, uh, the customer service rep, and then I trained how to do the window, and I trained how to do dish and all that. And then when I started working as manager, I got to see, like, oh, you broke up again. Yeah, that's awesome that you started at a, for a franchise, because franchises, you can really see the value of that, those policies and procedures. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, were you able to get it back up and going again, Melanie? I think so. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. Yes. Now we can hear you. 
And then also like, because you have to keep up with certain sanitary procedures, you can't just clean your oven, you have to clean around your ovens, etc. And like cleaning dish pit grates and drains, and you have to set aside certain procedures for things like that. So I feel comfortable with this course because uh, I still have a good bit of knowledge and all that stuff. Well, that's fantastic. That is great. Yeah, because you're going to use it and you're going to you take that knowledge and use it for your concept, for your assignments this week. Uh, Mary Lou, what was your question? Okay, one last question in regards to the tips. I know you said that normally a lot of places like tip um, employees are only like 215. How do you go about recording the actual tips? I know back in the day when I was there, there was no high tech like now. Um, and they they're like, oh, your tips make up for it. It's like, there was nights where I kid you not, I walked away with five cents for an entire shift. It's like, in addition to that, I had to still pay the bus boy. So I literally walked away in the negatives. So how are we keeping track of that nowadays? Because that's one thing that's really kind of kept me away from the fine dining where you have these paid waiting staff. Because it's like, I know how miserable it was when you work so hard, you bend over backwards, and you get a five cent tip. How do you how do you keep track of that nowadays? A lot of point of sale systems or time clock systems mm -hmm. will keep track of it for you. Some businesses just have a flat. We're gonna assume you got a twenty percent tip on every ticket, and that's a bummer. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll. Usually you report it with your time clock at the end of the day or in the point of sale system before you log out your account as a server. Um, it's really important information, not only for you, the server, it's also important for me, the owner or manager, um, because it plays into taxes, it plays into your paycheck. There's a lot of different factors going on that relate to how much you actually made for the night. Mm -hmm. So it's largely based on your own reporting and mm -hmm. the owner can typically look at what you're reporting and say, mm, that seems a little off if you're not reporting accurately. So, so I guess there's answer? better systems now. Yeah. There's better systems obviously now than over 20 years ago. Okay, guys, and now I have to get to another live session. So it was great seeing everybody. If you do have questions, please reach out. We can go over it more in detail. Just reach out, and then we can talk about it one-on-one. -on -one. I hope everybody has a fabulous, fabulous week. Uh, get started now on your assignment. You will see my slides. You will get those articles. You will have the live session, and get started now. Uh, I hope everybody has a great, great rest of your day, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody next week. All right, guys. Have bye, a great, everybody. great day. Happy Easter, everybody.